Pat Watson need to make that announcement, right? Okay. Good evening. Thanks for being with us this evening. Um, we got a couple announcements. Uh, Pat Watson is going to be added to the prayer list. She's been diagnosed with cancer. We need to remember her for sure in our prayers. Uh, also, the Laster family, uh, continue to remember them at their time of grief. And thank you for praying for Susie. She's doing some better this evening, so I'm encouraged by that. And thank you for your prayers uh, concerning her this evening. Uh, if there's any other announcements that we need to make, if you would let us um, send us a message on that or give us a call, we would be uh, more than happy to do that. And uh, we thank you so much for humor of the church and your prayers and other things that concern you. And we're going to have a couple songs and lesson this evening, so thanks for being here with us. Oh, prayer. If you'll pray with me. Almost grace to heaven, Father, Lord, we're thankful for this day you've given us, for this time you allow us to come together, Lord. Pray, Lord, for strength for the Laster family and for comfort for them. Pray for Susie, her recovery, Lord, for Pat Watson and the struggle she's going with. Also with Catherine Herring, Lord, and uh, her results on her test, indicating a couple spots, Lord, that you would be with her and that with the treatment that she's receiving, Lord, that you put your hand upon her. Just thankful, Lord, for the church here, for the ability we have to meet even in these trying times. Thankful for those who are members here, Lord. Please pray that you bless them and keep them safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We offer him our praise for the King. 
Good morning, or afternoon, evening, evening, good evening. This morning we were talking about, uh, in Matthew chapter 12, we talked a little bit about the demon, uh, the man that was uh, blind and dumb that couldn't speak, and Jesus casting out that demon. I made some references to that, and I thought maybe I would talk about that a little bit uh, this evening. Uh, you know, demons aren't something we like to think about a lot, and but we know they exist. In the Greek, it's the word daemon, and in the King James, that's often just translated as devil, uh, which is off the word diabolos, actually a different word in the Greek. Um, you know, there's a lot of speculation where demons come from, where well, all things were created by God. It really only makes sense that if Satan is a fallen angel and we protect that to be that way, that demons would be uh, also be fallen from heaven, had left their first abode, so to speak, or decided a different path. Um, they had a lot of presence in the first century. You don't see much about demons in the Old Testament. It was just a point in history that demons uh, were active, and it was because of Christ, I'm sure, and other things, but... Of course, Jesus, and we'll talk about that a little bit, his effect on that and effect on demons. Uh, the brother of the Lord, James, in James chapter 2, verse 19 through 20, he says, You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? In other words, James was using demons as an example that faith can't save us. You know, the demons believe and yet they're not saved. The demons obviously aren't in that position, and James was using that as an example, but he made his appointment there. He said the demons believe, and that's something we need to think about. The demons believe. Why do they believe? What do they know? You know, it's interesting in the temptation of Christ, when Satan come to tempt Christ, he, in the first two temptations, he says, if you are the Son of Man, and it's kind of an interesting idea. Did Satan not know that it was Jesus? Was Satan kind of taunting Jesus? If you're really him, would you do this, possibly? But it was interesting in the terminology. When we start talking about demons, it seems they have a recognition of that. There's not a lot of times in the Bible that demons speak, but there is times that they do. And in those times, they give us an insight, a little bit of insight into into who they are and how they recognize Christ. In Mark chapter 1, verse 23 through 27, um, you're going to have to do this. This thing just refuses to work. Um, it says, Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have to do with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And once you remember what he called him here, because it's going to be a little bit of significance. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. He said, What do you have to do with us? Did you notice that? What do you have to, Have you come to destroy us? And that's an interesting kind of thought because is it Jesus? He's talking about multiple demons. Is he talking about the man and the demon? And I think in that case, it's what we're talking about. We're talking about the demon and also the man that was possessed. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a voice and came out of him. They all were amazed so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. So they kind of made a distinction between clean spirits and unclean spirits. He commands the unclean spirits. If you look at Mark chapter 3, verse 11 through 12, it says, Whoever the unclean, whenever the unclean spirits saw him, and so this is a multitude of ideas, whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God. Now look again at that terminology here. You are the Son of God. Before it says the Holy One of God. It says, and he honestly warned them not to tell who he was. So you get the idea, especially from Mark, that many times he did that. Many times the spirits recognized him. Many times they, they identified him as the Holy One or as the Son of God. And so we see in those cases that that 
he, they knew who he was. Did Jesus know who they were? Did demons have names? Well, absolutely. Uh, angels have names. We don't know a lot of them. We know Gabriel, right? We know Michael, the archangel. We know Gabriel. But do demons have names? And the answer is absolutely. And the exorcists or exorcisms and exorcisms, exorcists felt power to know the name of the demon. If they knew the name of the demon, it somehow gave them power over that demon. So when the demon knew the name of Christ, he was kind of exercising authority in a way or trying to exercise authority over Christ to know the name of that. In Revelation chapter 9 and verse 11, it says, they have his king over them. They had his king over them. Uh, the angel of the abyss, his name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek his name is Apollyon. So there's one time that we know this angel, or this demon, this is the demon, he has the key to the abyss, and that's his name. You know, in the Old Testament, um, there was a name, there's names sometimes we associate as sometimes were gods or people they served, and the Hebrews also associated them with uh, demons, as in the case of Moloch. Um, but also in the New Testament, it was a passage read this morning, Beelzebub, or, uh, we often take him to be Lord of the Flies, and oftentimes we look at him as Satan. But a lot of times, especially in demonology, they look at him as a demon himself, as a chief demon, one of the seven chief demons. And so even that becomes a name. So yes, they have names, have identities. Just as angels had identities, these demons essentially had identities. But this evening you're going to talk a little bit about probably the most famous uh, demon passage in the Bible. And it's, it's all three Gospels. Matthew ascribes two demons to the scene, and it's a really short discourse. Um, Mark has a longer discourse. I want to use Luke this evening because Luke is a, kind of gives us a little more insight into it. And in Luke it says, They sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he came out onto the land, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons. And he had not put on any clothing for a long time and was not living in a house but in the tombs. Seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Now that terminology, we looked at the other times we looked at it, and one time he says, you are the Son of God. And then at one time he said, um, he said the Holy One of God. Now this Most High God is a real Gentile expression. That's the way the Gentiles looked at, looked at God, was the Most High God, because they, they basically were pluritheistic. They believe in a multitude of gods. And so they did Jesus' way. So we believe this is a Gentile individual. And there's another thing that backs that up, and that's the herd of swine that we're going to see. Swine were unclean to the Jews. And so Jesus cast, would cast them into a herd of swine. So the very fact that swine existed here, the very way that he recognized Jesus, kind of gives the idea, the indication, that this is a Gentile. A little bit different terminology and something that we look at here. Go ahead and turn me, Shannon. I beg you, do not torment me. And here we look at a singular idea. And sometimes the people say, well, this was the man that was demon-possessed speaking at this point. Do not torment me, possibly. For he had commanded the unclean spirit, singular, to come out of the man. For it had seized him many times. He was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard. Yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. So you see the power of these demons and the power that they gave this man. And Jesus asked him, he says, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered into him. Now, a legion was a large group of Roman soldiers, 100 Roman soldiers, so or 1,000 Roman soldiers. So a legion was a big group of soldiers. Oh. And a legion, so we get the idea, and some people say, well, that has, says how many. But really, in the Greek, that word is more the idea of a multitude of demons. So how many demons are there? How many demons can possess a man? Well, obviously, in this case, a lot, a lot. How many demons are there? A lot. How many angels are there? The Bible says there's myriads of angels. That term simply means it's innumerable, more than you can count. So if there's more than you can count angels, then there's a good chance there's more than you can count demons. 
So this idea of this multitude of that is, is quite substantial here. In other words, a lot of demons here we're talking about. And Jesus, and he said, Legion, for many demons had entered, it, had entered him. You know, demons are always seeking a place of rest. That's what the Bible says. It says that if you, this morning we read, if you cast out that and seven more come back in, they're seeking a place of rest, seeking a body. They're disembodied. So they're seeking that abode. And that appears to be, at this time in history, how they, how they got that. They're going to implore him not to send him into the abyss. We'll look at that. Flip me again, Shan. He says they were imploring him to command them not to go away into the abyss. Now, the abyss is what we looked at in Revelation. The abyss is different from hell or from the final destination. It's a place, a, a place of punishment and a place of containment for eternal beings. So this abyss is where eternal beings go to be punished. And they didn't want to go into that because there appears not to be an escape from that. Once you become entwined in the abyss or once they're placed in the abyss, until the end of time for a short time, there's no place for them to come out. There's no way for them to necessarily escape that. So they didn't want to be banished into that abyss. Now why Jesus heeded them, I don't know, possibly to further this story. There was a herd of many swine feeding there in the mountain, and the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine, and he gave them permission. They had to have permission from God. In other words, he had authority, and that's important. We're going to talk about that. He had authority over those demons. They had to seek permission to go into the swine. They couldn't just do that on their own. He could have cast them into the abyss. He could have just cast them out. But they wanted permission. He had authority over them. He had the authority to cast them out and the authority to tell them where to go. And the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. Now, we make a lot of that. What does that mean? You know, what happened when the swine were drowned? Then the demons had to go someplace else. So basically, it shows you the power of the one over the many. That Jesus rescued the one and the many are who ran off. The many were perished, but yet Jesus valued that life more than the life of that whole herd of swine. There's a lot of speculation about exactly what that means. But I think the main point here is that Jesus didn't banish them into the abyss. He allowed them a means of escape, and that was a means of escape that he put on to them. But they also were able to possess those animals, right? They were able to possess those swine. Now, Balak, of course, he was, or Balaam was, was spoken to by the donkey that was possessed by this angel of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord. So, you know, that's another case in the Bible where you see this idea, these animals or that, were, that were possessed. So these animals, uh, they were able to inhabit these animals also. So there's some things that we see in this as we go along. Flip me again, Shan. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran away and reported to the city and out in the country. And the people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out. And now Luke is the only one who tells us about the clothing. In the beginning, he was naked. That's the only gospel that gives us that. He was naked, and he was in the tombs, and he couldn't be bound. And you get this idea of this wild man that was untamable, and he was naked and tore all his clothes off. But when he comes back out, he says he's clothed. He's clothed and he's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now that's where you learn, at the feet of a teacher. So he is sitting at the feet. So it gives you the idea that Jesus not only had cast the demons out of him, but that somewhere he had obtained his clothing, a period of time had come on, he had come back, he was sitting at the feet of Jesus, which is where he would learn. He was clothed, he was in his right mind, and they were frightened. And they had seen it reported to them how the man who was a demon possessed, who was demon possessed, had been made well. Okay, flip me again, Shan. And all the people of the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked them to leave him. Now, why did they want him to leave? Because they were gripped with great fear. They were, it was scary for this to happen. They, this was a Gentile country. This wasn't a Jewish country. They were fearful of what was going on. And he got into a boat and returned. But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him. You know, there's only a couple of places in the Bible where Jesus healed someone and they really wanted to stay with Jesus. They were really begging him to go. 
Uh, there was a leper who came back, which was an interesting story. Where are the others? The one that came back. Um, Bartimaeus, old blind Bartimaeus, right? He followed praising Jesus. I um, love the story of Bartimaeus. And then in this story, he wanted to go with him, wanted to go with Jesus. What a great miracle. What a great thing had happened to him. His life had been returned to him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. You know, we read these stories in the Bible, and we see the nature of demons. We see that they're able to communicate, they're able to talk, they're able to recognize Jesus. They have names, they have identity. And it's scary for us, isn't it? The idea that demons exist and that Satan can work through there, that they're Satan's angels, that's kind of terrifying. Can demons possess us? Can demons possess somebody today? That's a question that's often, that's often asked. And so when we get to this, I, you know, I think we need to talk about that a little bit. In uh, Jude chapter 6, it says, Angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, and that gives you an idea who demons are. He says, He is kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Who has done that? Jesus has done that. He has kept in eternal bonds under darkness. That's the abyss. When Jesus died upon that cross, he limited the power of Satan. He limited the ability that Satan had to affect people in the way that Satan had affected them previously. He, he affected that. And so when he did that, he, he put them in eternal darkness. Does that mean all the demons are there? No, I don't believe that's true. I believe there's still demons that are free to do, free and active today. But did Jesus limit that number? Did Jesus limit the scope of what Satan could do? And Jude really puts this into perspective. Angels who did not keep their own domain, angels who had fallen to be demons, but abandoned their proper abode, the proper abode being heaven, Jesus has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So when he died, he bound demons. He bound Satan. He bound them until the day, which would be the end of time, the, the end of time. So in a sense, he's limited the power that they had. He did that by the blood, by the blood he shed on the cross, by the authority that he has over death, by the authority he has over Satan. He was able to limit the power, limit the scope, limit what they could do. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 through 3, it says, And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until a thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Now, if you read on down in Revelation 20, it's going to say he's released... But then he's immediately captivated again. Immediately it's the end of time. So even when he's released, he's not going to have time to do anything. Satan's reign, Satan's authority, Satan's ability to do what he did before Christ were limited. You know, demons are not something we see in the Old Testament, even before Christ. The idea of demons is a very New Testament, very gospel-oriented New Testament situation that starts to go away. In the Gospel of John, we don't see demon possession. John's a very light gospel. We don't see it in the Gospel of John. If we look in, in, you know, we begin to see that fade away. As we do miracles, fade away. As we do speaking in tongues, fade away. As we see all these other things, they begin to fade away as time goes on. And Jesus and the resurrection passes, things begin to calm down. These things begin to go away. He's been bound. He's like that dog that... Uh, we all had in our lives when we were kids, and I guess we all had them. I know I had a couple of them. And that dog was always on that chain. You ever pass that dog when you walked to school? I did. And he was always on that chain. You could look on that ground, and you could see as far as he could reach. And there would be grass. But before he could reach, there would be nothing but dirt, right? Nothing but claw marks. And you'd pass that, that dog, and, man, he'd hit the end of that chain every morning. Full tilt like he was going to get you. But you knew that chain was going to hold, and as soon as that chain had grabbed him, it would jerk him back, and boy, he'd be right up there, barking at you, snarling at you, giving you the what for. But you knew as long as you stayed in that grass, as long as you stayed out of that circle, you were all right. You know, I want to tell you, I believe that's a lot of how Satan is today. 
Jesus has bound him. He's chained him. Does it mean that he doesn't still have power? Absolutely he has power. Does it mean he doesn't have authority? Absolutely he has authority. Does it mean he doesn't have the ability to do things and harm us in our lives and tempt us? Absolutely he has the ability to do that. But the Bible is very intimate about the fact we're not to put ourselves within that chain, within that realm of where Satan can get us. If we allow Satan into our lives, Satan can come into our lives. But Jesus Christ, as a Christian, the Spirit of God fills our lives. Jesus fills our lives. And he inhabits us because we place him there through the word. We place him there through what we do. And when we do that, he fills our life. And because he were full of Christ, we have no room for anything else to inhabit us. See, the demon can't come back and find us empty because we're filled. We're filled with Christ. We're filled with God. So he doesn't have that authority over us to do that. Jesus has essentially bound him. He has chained him. We're no longer under the same situation that we were. Another reason I don't believe demon possession exists today is because Jesus did not give us the authority, the power, the means, or the knowledge to cast them out. If demons were something that you and I had to worry about today as they did in the first century, Jesus gave the apostles the authority to cast out demons on the first thing he gave them, the ability to cast out unclean spirits. Jesus gave that to other people close to him. Jesus gave them a means to deal with the problem. Jesus doesn't record in his word a way for us to do that, a way for us to deal with demons, a way for us to cast them out. We don't have that, we don't have that knowledge. Jesus didn't leave us with that because we don't need that anymore. We no longer need that, need to know that. What we need to know is that Satan can still have power and influence in our lives, and we need to stay out of the realm of his existence. We need to shun away from those things the Bible clearly tells us that have to deal with Satan. Witchcraft, sorcery, divination, astrology, things like that that have to deal with the realm of Satan and not the realm of God. You and I are forbidden to do that. We're forbidden to be involved in those things because God knows that those aren't things we need to put ourselves within his realm. And those are things we need to discourage in the lives of others. That they don't put themselves in that realm of Satan and in that realm of what he does. In a... Uh, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 29, Jesus says, How can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? Then he will plunder his house. You know, Jesus has told us that he's bound the strong man. He's bound Satan. He's bound the demons. Something you and I don't need to worry about today because Jesus on the cross took care of that problem. You know, it's one of those things we read in the Bible and it's scary. We see it on TV all the time, if you watch TV. There are a lot of shows that are centered around that, focused around that idea. But make no mistake, the one we serve is greater than the one in this world. Always. The power of God is always greater than the power of Satan. Jesus has bound Satan. He has chained him. He's taken him in the lives of Christians. Unless we put ourselves in his chain, we put ourselves in his realm, he doesn't have authority over us to take us, to use us in that respect as vessels of evil. You and I need to have confidence in Christ and his blood and his ability to fill us completely that Satan cannot have hold over us. There's sufficient evil within man without Satan, even in the world. There's sufficient evil within man to accomplish the evil that Satan would have us to do, even without his influence. You know, I'm glad that we don't live in a day when demons speak because I think that would be uh, rather terrifying, don't you? I'm glad that we don't have to uh, listen to that, and I'm thankful to Jesus Christ that he is, that he's bound Satan. Those people in those days, what a terrible thing that would be to be able to be taken over without anyone to protect you, any means of escape, and yet God has given us a means of escape God's given us a way, even in temptation, to escape. Always provides a way for us to escape. Through the blood, through the power of the Lord, he's taken authority away from Satan. Uh, interesting study, interesting thoughts um, as we look at, these, look at these things in the Bible, I believe. If uh, we can help you in any way this evening, if... Uh, you need to reach out to us. We want you to do that. We're going to have a couple of songs. We're going to have a prayer. 
to close this evening. And if you need us for any, anything in any event, uh, respond to us, message on Facebook, give us a call personally, let us know what we can do to assist you. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. It thrills my soul to hear the songs of praise we mortals sing below. And though it takes the parting of the ways, yet I must onward go. I hope to hear throughout a number of days the song of
Christ, Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day, Lord, that you've given us. Thankful, Lord, for this means that we have to meet, even in these difficult times. Thankful, Lord, for those that have been mentioned, that you'd be with them, that you would strengthen them, comfort them, return them to their health. Lord, answer our prayers, if it be your will to do so. Pray that you'd be with this church through this time. Help the Lord to stay strong, to stay vibrant, to stay connected. Pray that you'd forgive us. We fall short, Lord, of the people that you would have us to be, that you would help us to meet your expectations, Lord, in the way that we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 